hearing my, my displays, but okay, I'll read it. Uh, so uh, thank you, Nithya, for the, for the really nice scene setting uh, for why we're here today. I wanted to add a, also a little bit of historical context that I think is really germane to uh, uh, how the open source community actually got into a very favorable position when it comes to security. I might even use the term irrational exuberance, uh, which if anyone is familiar with where that term first uh, came into the popular mindset, it was at, uh, at the time of the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, 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 and when, uh, who was it who gave testimony about uh, irrational exuberance in the stock market? Anyways, uh, I think uh, what we actually need to do is think about how do we substantiate what is already actually a really great reputation for open source software when it comes to security, uh, but really try to understand also where some of that came from. So uh, I also tried to look deep in the past. Uh, I went to the Internet Archive and the oldest uh, screen grab I could get of the Netcraft uh, web server survey was from 99, uh, but they actually started in 95 with uh, a survey uh, of the entire web once a month where they would ask every web server, uh, what software are you running? And again, the internet, the internet was a high trust environment at the moment, uh, where to, uh, at that time, where uh, telemetry of what people were running was considered a public good. I think it's kind of crazy in retrospect that people would advertise the specific patch level of the server software they were running to make it easier for you to figure out which compromise would, 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 would uh, come in. But the great thing about this was, this was really the first moment where we had sub substantiated evidence that open source software was being used uh, out there in the wild uh, and in quantity, right? Uh, and being not just being uh, uh, used for, for research purposes or uh, uh, you know, early days of the web kinds of things, but actually being used in production. Because not only could you see quantitatively, and there, if I'd scroll down to the bottom, you'd see more, that the Apache web server was being used something like five times as much, uh, well, two and a half times as much as the Microsoft web server was being used, apologies to Microsoft, um, it was being used about uh, what, almost 10 times as much as the Netscape server was being used. Apologies to anyone who worked for Netscape. Um, uh, but also you could ask through this website, you didn't have to type HTTP commands, you could ask through this website, uh, what is that site running? And it made it really easy for those of us who were working on the Apache web server back then to make the case to our own pointy-haired bosses, um, which is what PHP is, uh, but also to others that um, not only can, you know, are people using this in production, you could also point people to CIA.gov uh, or to, uh, I believe it was Vatican.va, it might have been something else, but it was .va, and people could see, oh, it, Apache is running behind those, and if it's good enough for the CIA and for the Vatican simultaneously, that probably is good enough for, for your company, right? Um, but, which was great, and it, it allowed uh, us to make the case uh, that, that you could trust this, that uh, it's what garnered interest from some of the first uh, companies. Uh, IBM was really one of the first to say, can we in, in bundle Apache into our, our web-based products, that kind of thing. Uh, lots of others followed suit. But it also led us down, I think, a path that started to say popularity was a rough proxy for, or perhaps even equivalent to security. That the more people use this stuff, uh, I mean, it's certainly a case that we made, right? The more eyeballs, just naturally, uh, just almost by 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 the you know law of large numbers, um, and therefore you could trust it. And that seemed to be true. Uh, you know, we would get notices of security holes. We'd respond quickly, uh, and I, I, you know that that started to also be mirrored by the uh, Linux community that also. Also developed a great reputation for being able to respond very quickly. Um, and, and, and I'll note, by the way, there were very few analysts looking at this data. Uh, in fact, even IBM uh, sent a poll out to their top 100 customers in 97 asking, uh, and asking their CIOs, how many of you are using Linux or Apache or any open source in your organization? Only one out of those hundreds said that they were. Um, they repeated that by asking systems administrators uh, in those 100 companies and got back something like 93 of them saying, oh yes, we're using. It's just that the CIO never saw a purchase order for anything labeled open source software uh, until Red Hat came along and others, of course. But, um, uh, but anyways, that, it was really nice to have those, those numbers, but it led us to some interesting place. Um, the second places. The second thing that I think really helped uh, the world come to trust open source software was um, this: that a lot of the early communities ha uh, were really rigorous about setting up processes and setting up a culture that uh, said it's we need to avoid heroics. Like we might still have uh, 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 what, what's what was the term for like uh, um, one individual kind of at the top. Uh, uh, I'm struggling to count. Sorry. 
BDFL, sorry, Benevolent Dictator for Life, uh, BDFL. Um, thank you, I was blanking on that. I, I, uh, even if we have a Linus Torvalds or a Larry Wall or others, they are surrounded by people who can help catch the falling you know, hot knives, you know, or uh, help review patches, who can help enforce some process. And even at Apache, uh, one of the, the founding kind of principles was community over code. Um, we wouldn't start a project. Uh, we wouldn't even take one in as, a, uh, as, a, as an incubator project without some evidence that there was more than one person uh, interested in working on this code. And really, ideally, it should be from more than one company. Um, and that premise is that just then if somebody burns out, if a company changes tack, uh, whatever happens, there's some resiliency built into that. Uh, and, and somehow, we got away from that. Somehow in the last 20 years, we kind of got more to the swap meet model of open source code, where uh, rather than looking at and kind of, uh, uh, and not, not, not that those projects went away, certainly Apache and, and the Linux kernel and other uh, projects do have this kind of culture of let's pull communities together write, to write code, but we're all also very proud of the millions and millions of repos uh, up on GitHub, of the millions and millions of packages published at NPM, uh, and any one package is always very proud of boasting of the hundreds of thousands thousands or hundreds of millions of downloads they get per week, uh, again, as a sign of the law of large numbers means you should be able to trust us. And that just kind of seems wrong, uh, just at an intuitive level, and, it, and to me feels like a place where perhaps we've, we've gone a little bit in a different direction. And I'd like to see us return to this idea of open source communities and open source projects as being a little bit more like barn raisings, where uh, you know people working together to build a thing, it's not just about pull 10 or 100 people together to do in one day what would otherwise take one person 10 or 100 days. There's no way for one person to build a barn, uh, at least in the old Am uh, Amish, you know, barn raising kind of stereotype, right? That one person cannot pull the timber up, the timber frames up to mount them in the right way. Uh, they cannot, uh, you know, do all the things that are required to, to, to build a barn. It actually does take a village of people. And, it, and, and for me, that's always been the hallmark of well-run open source projects, too, is that they're people with complementary skills, people who might specialize in that one function that no one else really wants to look at, but at least one person is keeping an eye on, uh, uh, and hopefully more than one uh, uh, for every given line of code. Uh, and it's not perfect and it fails and it means a whole lot of overhead in managing a community, managing clashing priorities, managing overhead, but it pays off. Uh, and it pays off in more resilient code. And um, with respect to turtles, uh, with apologies to them actually, um, as we think about building uh, critical infrastructure and we think about from the bottoms up, you know, from the hardware layer up, uh, you know, which should be barn raisings all the way down um, uh, to, to, to really help build the kind of secure critical infrastructure that, that we know that we need. And I would love somebody to do a better graphic than this. This was me last night doing cut and paste eight times, but it seemed to work. Um, and, and so uh, for me, uh, the, the open source community really was one of the first places on the internet uh, oh, I'm sorry, an important angle on this, uh, I, I feel, is that the process, by, by having these things be barn raisings rather than kind of one-person projects, it made it possible to bring in anonymous and pseudonymous contributors. Uh, and, and this is really key. And I remember in the early days of the Apache web server, there was a con contributor named Alexi Kosit, who was uh, very productive, wrote great code, uh, but didn't write as much as some others, which was fine. But he did a lot of tending to the Usenet news group, of uh, answering new user questions, writing documentation, like a model open source contributor. And three years in to his contribution history at Apache, he wrote a note to the other uh, maintainers going, I'm really sorry, guys, but I probably will have to pull back a little bit of my contributions because I'm starting as a freshman in the fall at Stanford University. So like that was the, the fact that we have very low barriers to entry in open source is actually key in my opinion. I mean, I don't have numbers to back this up. I would love to see the econometrics, but I would assume a lot of you share this gut that is key to the scalability of the open source process and getting to uh, what, uh, you know, uh, what Eric Raymond called Linus's law, <laughs> which was with enough eyeballs, uh, all bugs are shallow, which intuitively we know that it's not quite a mathematical equation, of course, but um, no matter what tooling, what processes we come up with, they all fall down, in my opinion, if you have too few developers per line of code. 
Uh, and, and, and I want to note um, this, uh, this idea of being able to have our, our projects be open to uh, both lightly authenticated people uh, or even an totally anonymous contributors doesn't mean that reputation doesn't matter. We know it matters. We know that we use certain projects because we get to know the developers behind them. And we know that when a developer shows up on a project who has a history of contributing to other projects, that matters too and is part of the trust equation we as maintainers or as the community use to decide what to incorporate. But it really is important that we uh, avoid going down the path of the open source community becoming, look, there's, there were a lot of vendors at RSA two weeks ago selling tools to do know your developer behind open source projects and other, contributor, co other uh, collaborative software projects, uh, where factors such as national identity or IP address of where the contribution came from are considered a viable, a viable basis for trusting a contribution or not. And I think that would be very dangerous. Um, all major open source projects have healthy amounts of IP from contributors from countries that aren't necessarily places you and I would be able to travel to or want to travel to right now. Uh, and you know, geopolitical relationships come and go, but I think it's important that the open source community remain a global uh, community. And in a way that we have found challenging in other parts of the internet, we truly are one of the last remaining places on the net where um, uh, you can productively work and even come to trust people who are lightly authenticated into the community. And I think that's core to, to what we're trying to build. Um, and at the same time, we can, we can do that because we have processes. Uh, uh, how many people remember the University of Minnesota hack from uh, last year, I think it was, um, uh, where uh, a team of researchers at the University of Minnesota thought it would be cute to prove how fallible our processes were by slipping intentionally uh, broken code, well, well an, not a backdoor so much as an intentional vulnerability, into the Linux kernel. Uh, it was noticed, it was stopped, but not before it consumed a whole lot of time on the part of Greg Crow Hartman and, and Linus and some others. And in response, uh, the University of Minnesota has now been banned uh, I think by IP address. I don't know if it's by email address. Um, but, uh, but now been banned permanently from contributing to the Linux kernel, uh, and which kills <laughs> Jim Semblin's heart because he's a graduate of University of Minnesota. Good old you know, Minnesota uh, kid. Um, but uh, I, uh, yeah, uh, th we have these processes. We have these mechanisms, but they're not perfect. Are they perfectable? That's worth asking. Um, but, but we need to, to fight what might otherwise be a tendency to slip into a dark place. So in my perspective, we need tools that measure the trustworthiness of code based on objective measures that go beyond number of downloads in NPM, number of stars on GitHub, uh, uh, number of, of users out there. Um, uh, certainly, we can be better at turning users into contributors, turning contributors into maintainers, that sort of thing. But, but a lot of what's going on in the open SSF matches that first uh, kind, of, kind of thing. The, uh, uh, you'll hear about a lot of that today. The best practices badge work, the scorecard work, uh, uh, things that we're looking at in the, in the um, mobilization plan, all of that speak to uh, this need to better understand through processes, through measurements, through tools, uh, what, uh, 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 how, do we, how do we get an objective sense of the trustworthiness of code? Not because we want to stop using certain open source packages, but so that the better ones can know where to invest to increase that. We are far past the point of uh, um, Dunbar's number, right, 150, uh, which is about the number of social relationships anybody can, any one person can keep in their brain at one time. Far past the point of being able to rely on that as our mechanism to know what open source projects to trust at the uh, tens of millions of different components out there. We need other better tooling to scale that up. Uh, uh, we also need processes that simply encourage better security practices by developers. Uh, 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 and, and that also is a theme for many of the projects you'll hear about today and are a key part of the OpenSSF. Um, speaking to this third part, though, about uh, uh, um, teamwork, this is a place where I challenge us a little bit to think about where perhaps some existing efforts in the open SSF, uh, perhaps new efforts that we might take on, might encourage uh, a little bit more teamwork and shared responsibility amongst open source projects uh, and shared responsibility for security. I, I encourage folks to, 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 if you're working on one bit of open source code, you've thrown it out, you might have hundreds of thousands of downloads a week. That's great, but what happens when you burn out? 
what happens when um, you slip in a bug that you didn't realize and notice, and it wouldn't it be great to have other people help you find those? This is why I loved open source, because I'm not a good coder. The world is much better off without my code in the world. Um, I, I, I was. It wasn't just me being humble, it was me being completely honest. I'm, this is broken, this is something, I know there's something broken about this, please help me find the bugs in it. Uh, uh, and for me, with that, without that sounding board, um, there is no point. Um, and, and most important for us is to think about how to add the words by default to every one of those, right? How do we make the lift as, as, as zero cost as we can to adopt better tooling, to adopt better practices, to get this into the default workflows, the default build tools, uh, 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 the systems that, that we use as open source developers and contributors to make this all work? Um, and, and so, as I mentioned, you'll hear a lot today. Uh, you won't get everything going on in the open SSF. We are kind of a circus. Uh, I, I say that lovingly, and, and somebody who likes going to the circus, like there's lots of things going on at, at open SSF, lots of different teams, and that is a part of our strength. We're roughly divided out by working groups uh, in certain thematic areas. We also have a set of initiatives, uh, uh, Alpha Omega, SigStore, and the GNU toolchain infrastructure that uh, are additive to a lot of those different efforts. And certainly, there are lots of people on multiple working groups and efforts at the same time. Uh, uh, there's a lot more we can do. And one of the things we in the OpenSSF community are actively trying to figure out is how much to be big tent versus best of breed and small and focused, right? Um, and and this, is, this is something you'll perhaps hear more about today, is how do we, how do we tread that line and, and, and make sure we're tapping into really the best of what's going on in the open source world and the best, um, uh, the best thinkers, the best developers, the best people thinking about how this maps to the real world. Um, now, in the remaining kind of uh, 17 minutes, I want to pivot a little bit. Oh, and thank you, of course, to all the organizations. Here's a few of them. Uh, uh, there's actually a longer list of, of the full membership you can see on the website. It's organizations like these that are uh, really helping make those efforts work, uh, both through their individual developers contributing and participating on the working groups and the projects, but also by putting some money in to allow us to spend money on some of the work that, uh, that is necessary to, to do. Um, uh, now I want to pivot and talk a little bit about uh, um, this uh, effort that we put together since the beginning of this year to take this circus, uh, so to speak, on the road and to think creatively about if we were to, to not just say, here's a bunch of things that might help the world, but to, to get activist about it and invest in it and say, could we actually close uh, uh, some of the known issues we have in the world around how open source is built uh, in some reasonable time frame in the next few years? How would we do it, and, and frankly, how much would it cost? And a lot of this was spurned uh, by, uh, by the log4j shell vulnerability. Uh, I try to avoid saying log4j because the developers behind log4j and other Apache projects are professionals. They are doing a great job. I want to give them due credit. They are, uh, uh, they are by and large, for, for, for a component that's used as pervasively as it is, again, the law of large numbers does say occasionally we will stumble over vulnerabilities here or there, and it should not reflect upon them. So I do try to say log for shell uh, when I can, just to, to be reflective of that. But log for shell broke the internet. It caused a whole bunch of organizations, particularly in government, to, to go, this is an earthquake, we've got to scramble, we don't even know where we're running it. Uh, you know, uh, the number of organizations that said, oh, no problem, uh, we're using, you know, the, bug, the bugs are in the CV is in uh, log4j uh, log version 2, but we're on log4j version 1, so we're not vulnerable, which had been out of maintenance for five years. Uh, I, uh, you know, yeah, it, it was an earthquake, right? And it caused, a, it caused people at all levels, both the private sector and the public sector, to reasonably ask the question, if, if this is an example of doing it right, if this is an example of the process working, well, we, we would be frustrated if we woke up one day and every bridge crossing every, uh, for every highway bridge crossing every uh, river had to be shut down for a month while it got re-architected and re cement re-poured so that we can then cross that bridge again and, and, and drive over it. Or we would be frustrated if the electrical grid had to go down for three days while we updated it, which is dauntingly similar <laughs> to uh, some of what we're, we've heard about. You know, um, The electrical grid is much more of a software-driven piece of infrastructure these days than anything else. So, so they, it caused a bunch of people to ask, are you all okay? Is this really what it's, how it's supposed to work? And 
So the White House convened this meeting in January, uh, invited a bunch of us there, uh, David Nally, if he's in the room, I don't know if he is, uh, from Apache uh, and a few others from Apache, the few of us from the Linux Foundation, uh, about 10 other companies, and they kind of posed this question. And, and for about six hours, uh, we uh, came out with basically uh, the question, what would it take to actually solve many of these issues that we were coming up, which could roughly be categorized in three kind of different buckets. How do we secure how the code is written? How do we uh, get better at finding the vulnerabilities that are out there and fixing them? Uh, and then, how, <coughs> apologies, how do we get better at pushing those fixes out to the world? Uh, and, um, and so we went back as the OpenSSF and started a little bit more privately, kind of, you know, uh, talking about this, talking about it in, in, the, in the governing board, talking about this, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one between us and staff and a lot of others, and said, well, maybe what we should do is think about how to frame and organize all those different efforts in the circus uh, in the, uh, with, with this idea of what would it take to push those to the point where they can actually address um, a, a set of issues that are responsive to those goals. What are things that are working now that we could double down on uh, and, and, and put some more resources behind? Um, in a somewhat inorganic manner. Uh, I mean, I'll be honest, most of the time at the Linux Foundation, when we open projects, we as Linux Foundation staff and the funding kind of goes into air traffic control, right? It goes into uh, convening the space, hosting the calls, hosting you know, whatever is required, even the build systems, that kind of thing. It doesn't really go into top down driving this stuff to be everywhere. It does sometimes. Uh, in the automotive grade, automotive grade Linux project, uh, that's a community where there aren't a lot of open source developers in companies like yet, uh, or at least a few years ago, inside of companies like Toyota and Nissan and the like. And so when they organized, they did go out and, and pay developers to build a body of code. Uh, other projects like Let's Encrypt, uh, actually run a service which requires an ops team, which re requires you know, some actual uh, staff to go and run this, even though the code is open source, even though uh, it's built on open protocols, and, and they work uh, very, very publicly. So with us, it was a little bit like, well, even given all of the folks showing up to our circus, making contributions, how might we best organize our efforts to go and, and, uh, uh, and accomplish some of these things? Uh, and we're not going to solve them tomorrow. What, what could we do, though, in a year or two years to make it work? Um, and, and so what are some ambitious but pragmatic targets that we could set to make that happen? Uh, and in 10 minutes, I'm not going to be able to go into depth on the next 10 different slides, but we put together a plan, uh, a mobilization plan, that laid out 10 different streams that uh, identified some reasonably interesting places that we felt would make a big difference in the trustworthiness and reliability of open source code. And frankly, to uh, bring the reality up to that set of expectations, that irrational exuberance around uh, the security and open source code. Um, we published this uh, it, in May uh, and had uh, convening uh, in DC with friends of ours in government. It was not a government plan. It was not intended to be, you know, uh, here's what we want government to pay for. But it was intended to say, look, those of us organizing this would like to collaborate with our peers in government. There's a few, in fact, from, uh, from uh, the government here at OpenSSF Day and at the conference this week. Um, and we'd like to make sure whatever you're doing in that, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, inside of government around pushing further on SBOMs or evolving the cybersecurity uh, 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 infrastructure uh, framework uh, uh, driven by NIST or other places that that's complicated. Entry. By the way, I'm sorry they're showing Top Gun uh, Maverick next door, so um, I, I, I can't compete with that, but I will try. Um, uh, and, and so what we identified, to our surprise, was actually uh, uh, what we thought was kind of a low number, $150 million worth of well-vetted spending that would go and pay, pay for itself tremendously. So we had this convening in DC. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, tried to pull in more companies, more open source community members, uh, more organizations. It was never going to be enough, of course, but uh, uh, for as public as we'd normally like to be about how we work. Uh, but it was enough to try to get across to the government, we're serious about this. And this uh, was something that uh, we'd like to repeat with other governments around the world as well. And we've got some conversations starting in a few uh, places to have a similar type of, of uh, kind of rollout and conversation with them. In that event, uh, we identified $30 million in pledges to that project. Thank you to many of the companies who are here today who helped make that work. These are pledges. These are uh, moments where uh, this is basically an investment fund, if you think of it that way, uh, towards the 150. So we're going to be raising more uh, from different sources uh, to, uh, uh, to go and hopefully start work on each of those different streams independently. 
Um, I won't be able to go in depth, you'll be able to find it, but very briefly, just to give you the highlights, uh, uh, one of them is about trying to reach everybody with many of the security education uh, documents and processes that we've developed here. Thank you particularly to David Wheeler for that work, he'll be talking about it later today. Um, one of those is about trying to, you know, that, that risk assessment kind of that you talked about, how do we better understand the riskiness of code? Well, pulling together all the data that the tooling we're coming up with uh, can give us, as well as additional data sets, into one place to go to say, I'm, I, I'm interested in this code, what, what is its risk profile, right? Uh, and can I compare that to similar code? Uh, another is to further the work of the SIGSTOR community on digital signatures. Uh, uh, that you'll hear more about today as well. Um, uh, to invest in memory safety and the conversion of some core internet utilities like NTPD or, or further invest in Russell's, for example, the Rust library for TLS, uh, to try to eliminate whole categories of vulnerabilities in, uh, in really critical software to establish a security and incident response team, uh, uh, to focus on uh, specifically open source projects who are, don't have the funding uh, or have a big community around them who can help manage a vulnerability disclosure process. Um, uh, another tool to really double down on the work going on in Alpha Omega to do more pervasive scanning of open source code on a regular basis to try to find new vulnerabilities. To be, you could think of it as an open source version of Project Zero uh, at, at Google. Um, Another one to invest in code audits, uh, Amir here from Ostif uh, knows this process well. Uh, not for a large number of projects, but for uh, starting with the 50 and maybe to the, hope, hopefully to uh, 200 projects a year in the kind of third party audits that really start to ask you, you know, did you mean to put that chainsaw in the middle of that dinner cutlery set? Right? So not just the, the potential memory corruption issues, but also really starting to ask at a feature level or an architectural level, you know, are you, have you really built this defensively uh, and, and thoughtfully? Um, to encourage more data sharing, to understand what are really the most critical open source projects, not based on download numbers from NPM, but based on data that might actually be hard to get in public data sets. So uh, uh, working with, with uh, uh, distribution points and vendors to try to collaborate around, around that data and, and help make like the Harvard study that uh, we published recently uh, uh, even more, more thoughtful and, more, and, and perhaps more frequently updated. Uh, to really invest in SBOM. So far, we haven't done much in the open SSF with software bill of materials. Uh, we've, we've talked about it. There's been some work in the security tooling community. Uh, uh, thank you to Josh Bressers if you're here. Um, uh, but this is a place we know there's a need to invest more. This particularly was a big message from our partners in government. Um, I, I, we need to also finally just look at the, especially the last few stages of the software supply chain, the distribution points, uh, the, 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 the software repositories, and ask, is there more that we can do to bring salsa, for example, to those, uh, to bring uh, uh, a kind of uh, native consumption of SBOMs to those, you know, to other things that can help make, uh, make it easier for people consuming software through what are essentially the Apple app stores <laughs> of the open source community, be more thoughtful about how they get that data. And this is work that I'd say has already begun through uh, collaboration with, uh, uh, the, through the Securing Software Repositories Working Group uh, that is really just getting underway. Um, all this work together, um, you know, uh, there were teams that formed around each of those 10. I want to thank everybody here who per did participate in those work streams. It was very short time frames, partly intentionally so, so that we could get to really just a first kind of size of the bread box kind of notion. Uh, uh, these numbers will change. This is a draft. Uh, the, 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 the process from here is that we will continue working with interested parties on those streams to refine the proposals to get to the point where we can start to match them up against pledges or other sources of funding. Um, frankly, $150 million was cheap in my book. Uh, I, I talked about that a bit. $150 million might sound like a lot. Uh, certainly for any one open source project, it's a lot. There's very few with uh, I, I, I budgets that are larger than that. But I want to give you one other number against which it sounds fairly affordable, $700 million. Does anyone know what number I might be referring to? when I'd say 700 million. It's a little obscure, I apologize, but it was just a few years ago that uh, the FTC fi levied a fine on Equifax uh, for uh, its breach, its data breach, uh, of su and fined them $700 million um, due to a vulnerability in Apache Struts. Again, not to blame Apache Struts, not to blame Apache or anything like that. In fact, I believe they were only like a few months out of date uh, in, in, in their patching, uh, but that provided enough of a window for somebody to come in and exfiltrate a ton of data. And the FTC has already started to say they will issue a notice 
um, it already issued a notice saying that if they find that future data breaches or other uh, major you know, uh, compromises occur because somebody did not update their log for J frequently enough, uh, David's <laughs> applauding here, because this is, these are the kinds of nudges that we're going to see more of, both from the uh, public sector, I think even from folks like insurance companies who insure against cybersecurity breaches, they're going to start to raise the, the floor when it comes to what, what's the minimum that they expect organizations to do to be more secure. Um, uh, and uh, this is serious. This is the government getting serious. These are the sticks. And I am much more about carrots, frankly, much more about incentives and like helping people. In fact, a big theme through the mobilization plan has not been how do we make open source developers get more serious, you know, uh, but has been about how do we show up with help? How do we add to um, uh, uh, their existing processes and with, uh, uh, with, with better tooling, with, with people and other things like that? In fact, the vast majority of that $150 million are, are, is, is paying for people to show up on projects and say, we're here to help in one way or another. Um, and so, so I think you know, pressures like this are pretty useful. Um, at, at the end of the day, the mobilization plan is just one element of what we do at the OpenSSF. It's about sprinkling some uh, accelerant on top of existing efforts. Uh, at the core of OpenSSF, though, we are an open source project like any other you'd find uh, where anybody can contribute, where anybody can use the tools and, the, and benefit from uh, the standards and all the goodness coming out and the, and the, and the docs and, and the guides. I mean, there's too much to mention. Um, this is about just trying to sprinkle, you know, douse a little bit of fuel uh, on, on, on these different efforts and make that work. So uh, come in and, get, and, and, and check out the plan, but, but do check out the rest of what's going on inside OpenSSF and apologize to James Brown for stealing his riff, but uh, get involved. Uh, and with that, uh, I think I'd like to pass the baton back to Crow. Thank you all.